Hello everyone, welcome to Instructive Eats again. We're continuing our series on adding rigor to math. The last two videos, which you should see a link in the top right corner here, uh, the last two videos were on depth. So we really just defined depth and we looked at math examples that infuse depth. Um, our video today is going to be on complexity. So we're gonna define complexity and we're gonna take a look at some math examples. Now, the math examples that we used for depth had complexity embedded in it. So we may take a look back at some of these examples and then later we're gonna look at some new ones. So to get started, what is complexity? Well, complexity is all about connections, really. Just making connections across ideas, concepts, between disciplines, to get a real thorough understanding of a topic. Um, or to be able to create unique and effective solutions to problems. Uh, so one big component of complexity is connections. And we can see that in complexity, relying, forcing students to rely on background knowledge and skills, which is again, connections to what they already know. Um, and they're utilizing of self-regulating strategies like planning uh, to solve a problem, organizing, whether that's materials or, or information in order to solve a problem, um, self-regulating strategies like persistence and having the patience to solve difficult problems. Um, all of that though, complexity usually is about solving authentic tasks or real world problems. Now, I just want to say right off the bat that when we look at some of these suggestions, you don't have to use all of the suggestions. It would be very cumbersome to pick a math problem and say, you know what, I'm going to use all of these depth and complexity suggestions because it would take you hours to come up with a really good project or a really good problem to give to your students. And that's not what we want. We just want you to be able to take what you already have and to quickly just infuse some rigor into it. <clears throat> so what does it look like in math? Well, complexity, being that it's all about connections, it's going to touch on math, uh, multiple math domains. So you have a problem that forces students to use MBT uh, standards and concepts, fractions, measurement data, geometry, algebraic concepts. Um, of course, we're focused more on the elementary side of things. Um, but, you know, as you move up into middle school and high school, um, you can incorporate all the multiple math domains that they've worked on. So tied to that connections across or between grade level standards from previous grades as well and as teachers often teachers they always have that that particular stance that i'm teaching fifth grade i just need to teach foundation fifth grade standards that said i don't want to go above i don't want to go below um, but that's not really realistic we're not isolated to just our experience that we've had since august of this school year or whenever your school year starts so um, especially in the beginning of the year, when you're talking about working with just place value, it doesn't make sense to just stay within your grade level and work on place value concepts. Um, if you want to make it complex and engaging, you're going to have to go back to previous grade level standards and embed their understanding of measurement data and geometry and all of that along with what they're working on currently. Um, and then continuing that connections vein, it, your math problems, if you want to make it complex, you can connect it to other disciplines, force them to utilize reading or ge geography in order to solve those math problems. Um, so going on to the self-regulating strategy side of things, a lot of times complex problems will involve research or planning. And like I said, not all of the problems that you add rigor to have to, um, but that's one suggestion. Another suggestion is create problems with multiple steps that require persistence or problems with multiple steps that involve realistic or real world tasks. Um, here, this one goes beyond equations, puzzles, etc. utilizes scenarios. Um, I think it's definitely important that a lot of our problems go beyond just equations and puzzles, but uh, like you know from the previous videos we talked about magic squares their magic squares are flexible it gets straight to the point it forces kids to really go deep into content and magic squares also force kids to um, utilize their persistence their organizing and so forth in order to solve those problems so like i said these are suggestions you don't have to pick all of them and if you did you'd be really limited to what you could make most of your problems would be really lengthy word problem projects and such which 
really kind of defeats the purpose of adding rigor, especially when we're trying to do so to engage kids. And then the final example <clears throat> or suggestion necessitates the use of problem solving strategies. So we could have a whole video just on problem solving strategies, but to give you a quick example, I'm going to go back to what we did with depth and I'm going to show you how we actually utilize problem solving strategies to solve some of these problems. So this dr plus dr plus dr plus dr equals md, um, it had depth infused because we removed information and we forced kids to make generalizations. But then we also utilized the problem solving strategy of making a list. Because we looked at this d and we noticed, hey, it's in the tens place. It's limited to just the digits one through nine. So let me list out all the digits one through nine. And then I can determine whether or not it's possible for D to be any of these digits. And we could see pretty quickly that, well, all these D's added up together make M. And M didn't regroup it to the hundreds. So none of these D's could be big enough to force a regrouping. So D couldn't be 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, or 3. So by making an organized list, which is one problem solving strategy. It allowed me to keep track through my multiple steps, keep track of all the information so that I could limit my possible answers. So that was one example, making an organized list. Um, there were lots of uh, areas in here where there was some deductive reasoning involved and things. Um, and later on, we're gonna talk about working backwards. So that's just to show you that even these depth problems had complexity and to show you one example of of uh, problem solving strategies in use so let's go ahead and take a look at some problems that have complexity embedded so i'm looking at the million dollar pbl here and you've probably seen a million pbls about kids spending a million dollars and it's exciting and it's fun. Kids love to go on online and look up all the things they would buy with a million dollars. But, but how complex really is that kind of project? The project itself, just spending a million dollars isn't complex. Like the only thing they really need to do is know how to subtract and regroup. So how do we make it more complex? Well, here are two prompts that I just modified a little bit. Um, and you'll see that it makes connections across disciplines and across different domains and so forth. It definitely forces them to do some planning um, and it definitely makes connections across disciplines too. So the first example, what is your dream job? Well, now you need to search what kind of education or degree do you need to be qualified for that job? What school provides that possible degree for you? And how much would it cost to, to go to school there? So oftentimes when you're looking at universities and colleges, they give you a price per credit. Well, then they need to do some research. How many credits do I need in order to graduate? Or they might give you price per semester. So then you need to research, well, how many years am I going to be in school in order to obtain this degree or this education that I need to do my job? And if I have two semesters per year, I'm doing multiplication. So I'm going beyond just subtraction and I'm doing multiple step problems here. Um, this also kind of gets into a, a little bit of connections across disciplines. So they, they can start seeing how different careers, different disciplines may uh, require more education, less education and so forth. Um, but that's just a quick example to show you that we can go just beyond subtraction in a pro in a PBL like this. Number two, instead of just telling a kid, oh, I want you to buy a home. You can tell a, a kid, I want you to purchase two homes anywhere in the world but one home must be within 10 miles of the Pacific Ocean and the ocean must be to the east of the home. The other home must be at an elevation of at least 10,000 feet above ocean level and within 10 miles of a body of water. And right now you're forcing them to understand some geography. They need to understand I'm buying a home with the Pacific Ocean to the east. I'm not going to be in the country I would prefer to be in. And then from there, they're not going to give you a price in dollars. It may be in a different currency. So you're going to have to be able to make a, a conversion. Um, or they may measure things in meters. 
Um, and so you're going to have to make sure that you take miles and you convert to, me to meters or kilometers, um, kilometers. Um, you're going to have to measure feet differently, too, depending on um, which maps you're looking at. So they're using research. They're using planning. They're making connections to geography. They're making connections across domains, measurement and data in order to solve this problem. So that's just a quick example of how we can take two prompts and make it more complex. Now, take a look at this word problem here. Uh, this is another example of a word problem. It's a realistic situation, but how can I make it more complex? It says Mimi went to the mall with $50. She went to the shoe store and spent half her money on shoes. So easy enough, $50, spending half the money is $25. Then $14 more on socks. So I have 25 and I spent 14. I just have $11 left. And the question is, how much money does she have left? $11. Really straightforward. Um, really simple, but then take a look at how we can make it more complex. Mimi went to the, went to the mall. She went to the shoe store and spent half her money on shoes. Well, how much money did she have to start? Well, I don't know. So I don't really know what half her money means. Then she spent $14 more on socks. I don't know how much money she had left after spending half of it. So I don't know how much money she has after spending $14 more. Then she went to a clothing store and spent one third of her, of her remaining money on pants and then spent $18 at the food court. All this is meaningless to me. Then it says she went home with $6 left. Well, now I have an ending point, $6 left. And so now I know I need to use a problem solving strategy. I need to work backwards and so working back from uh, starting with six dollars and working backwards i can start making um, some meaning out of these fractions so how much money did she have when she first arrived at the mall i know she left with six dollars i know prior to her leaving she spent 18 at the food court right so i know then that six plus 18 is 24. well before she had 24 dollars she had a remaining amount of money and one third of that was spent on pants. So that remaining amount of money was this one third and the $24 that she had, which means then that this 24 is two thirds of that remaining money. And this one third must have been $12 because I know that the two thirds is $24. So one third must have been 12. So at this point, when she started uh, shopping at this clothing store, she must have had $36. Right before then, she spent 14 on socks, so she had $50. And before that, she spent half of her money on shoes. Well, if she spent half of her money and she was left with $50, that means then that she had $100 to start when she went to the mall. So you can see how complex this got just because I forced the, the student to work backwards. This one third fraction here was meaningless, but as they worked backwards, they needed to think, well, I had $24 and right before then I spent one third of all my money. So 24 must be two thirds, one third must be $12. And then this half, this other fraction, half of what? You had to work backwards in order to determine that. So those are some examples on how we can infuse complexity into these real world um, authentic task problems. Uh, the last example is a magic square. <clears throat> so we understand what magic squares are from the previous video. All rows, all columns, um, all diagonals, rows, columns, and diagonals all have the same sum. And in this magic square, I've already used some depth strategy. I took out one of the numbers, so I need to use some deductive reasoning and so forth in order to figure out um, one of these missing numbers and go from there. And from our depth video, you, knew, you know that in this row here, I have eight ninths and one ninth, and then I have this unknown. But this also shares this unknown square with this five ninths here and this bottom right unknown number. So I can say that this one ninth and eighth, eight ninths 
must be equivalent to this five ninths in this unknown bottom corner here. And so that would give me four ninths there. So the depth is added, that's fine, but how can we make connections and make it more complex? So if you look at the problem here on the right, I have, instead of giving them one ninth, I say e A equals two thirds minus five ninths. So now they're gonna have to convert fractions and they're gonna have to subtract fractions to find A. I didn't just give them B, I told them B is five A. So now they need to use algebraic understanding, how this is represented and multiply. So now we're multiplying fractions. And then for C, I didn't just give them eight ninths, I gave them C equals the perimeter of this magic square. So they're using geometry, understanding of squares, knowing that all sides are congruent. Even though it looks like a rectangle, they should know we call it a magic square. It doesn't matter what it looks like because we're stating it's a square. And then they need to use their understanding of measurement to figure out, well, if I have two ninths of a unit here for this side, what's the total perimeter? And once they figure out the perimeter, they figure out what this top right corner is, that it's eight ninths, and then they can solve the magic square um, using their deduct deductive reasoning and other strategies and so forth. So you can see from these three examples that making connections, forcing students to have to use self-regulating strategies like planning, um, using problem-solving strategies as well, can really take a problem and make it even more rigorous. So I hope that you enjoyed that video. Uh, again, we are Instructor Beats. You can find us on YouTube at Instructor Beats Official, or you can find us on Instagram at Instructor Beats. We're going to have a Magic Squares video come out uh, soon where I can show you how to create Magic Squares and give you ideas on what kind of content you can use Magic Squares with. Uh, but until then, make sure you turn on the notifications for your YouTube. So anytime we come out with the video, you'll be notified right away. Um, Instructor Beats out. <laughs>